Hi, welcome. I am Jennifer and today we are doing first aid in the classroom. Um, thank you for coming. There's PowerPoints and pencils that y'all can grab and take notes and go along um, while we're teaching. So, um, I graduated in May with my associate's degree in 2021. I am currently working on my bachelor's degree. Um, I have taken a first aid class in college. Okay, so now we have a pretest. If everyone will make sure to put your um, initials on it so that way I can compare the pre versus post test. Uh, we'll just have five minutes.
Let's do that. Okay. Now that we're done with our post test, we have an icebreaker. So if everyone will get into a group, three, four people, and make a list of um, things you think belong in a first aid kit. Okay, now another icebreaker. You can just raise your hand, nod. Has anyone ever dealt with an emergency where you believe first aid training would have helped you? Okay, so here are my goals and objectives. So our goal of this course is the class to educate school staff about first aid and the necessary supplies. Okay, so by the end of the lecture, you will be able to make a list of necessary necessary supplies for a first aid kit, write a school safety plan, demonstrate first aid skills like wrapping a sprained ankle. We'll get into groups and practice that. Um, distinguish between an emergency and a non-emergency. List requirements for first aid training for special need classrooms versus um, regular classrooms. So what is first aid? First aid is providing basic medical help to someone in need, someone that has an in in injury. Um, but this is usually before EMT arrives in major accidents, so things like CPR. Um, or in small accidents, wrapping an ankle. Um, it's important to learn to help someone who's injured and prevent the injury from getting worse. So um, our goal is to help stop the pain, but increase safety to the child. So a few first aid examples, um, choking, sprained ankle, allergic reaction, anaph anaphylactic shock, and nosebleeds. These are the ones that are most common in elementary schools. So here we have a chart of first aid kit supplies. Um, this is what it is and this is what they're used for. So we're going to go through all of them and I have brought, bought this first aid kit. It comes with basically everything you need except for this um, that we use to wrap your ankle. And it also does not come with an EpiPen or inhaler, but these are two things that I think are important to put in, in there, especially if you have a child that requires these. So, antiseptic wipes or antibacterial cream. So we have alcohol prep pads to clean the wounds. And we have, this is sting relief, antiseptic wipe. And the antibiotic ointment. This is put on for scrapes, scratches, like when a kid falls on the playground, skins their knee. So band-aids are right here. So you'll want to put this on bleeding wounds. Um, kid picks their fingernails and their finger starts bleeding so they'll need a band-aid. So we have galls to here. So we have galls pads and we'll need tape too. This is for like bigger wounds before they go to the doctor. It's just something to cover up the wounds. Um, Antihistamine cream for insect bites, ant bites. When the kids are like, oh, ant bit me, it's itchy. We'll need to put that on there. So, tweezers. This first aid kit came with these tweezers. We get these out for splinters. So, there's trees on the playground. They're trying to climb a tree. They get a splinter in their finger. And 
you can use these to get her out. So, um, finger splints, which I did not have in here, but can be used for smash fingers in the door, bathroom stall. An ice pack, two came in this first aid kit. Um, when children fall, get a bruise, you can just put one of these on there. So the, a lot of these things are good for um, PE classes to have around or when you're going to a playground or to carry on um, field trips. So we also need a thermometer that's good you can check for the fever before sending them to a nurse. We have gloves. Um, you need to keep your hands clean. If there's blood, you don't want that on your hands. And hand sanitizer to clean your hands before. So um, we have rolled gauze and wraps. It's good for sprained ankles. So this inhaler is good for someone who has asthma. And you never know when they're going to have an asthma attack, so you want to have one on hand. Because sometimes children may forget it, leave one at home, or it might be in the classroom, so you might need to carry this with them outside. Because if they have an asthma attack, they need it now and then. So, an EpiPen. The two most common like allergic reactions in school systems would be um, bee stings outside and peanut butter so we need to have these on hand if a child comes in contact with those allergies so here's pictures of some first aid supplies so this picture has his ankle wrapped up with an ice pack so that's what the ice pack can use you use for this is the rolled gauze first aid kit tweezers and um, some more gauze so first aid skills, um, putting on and taking off the gloves. So when you, first thing before you put on gloves, you want to clean your hands. If it's an emergency, you're outside, hand sanitizer's good to go. Make sure you dry your hands completely before you put your gloves on. Then, when you put your gloves on, great. Then taking them off, it says to pinch and hold the outside of the glove near the wrist Pull down that one hand, peel downwards away from the wrist, turn the glove inside out. Um, then pull the glove away until it's removed. Then you're going to your second hand, same thing, pull down here at your wrist with your hand. Um, pull down, over, and then you'll make it into a little ball. Also you can take your gloves off by like pinching it, pulling it down, going with this, now this is a clean hand, going like that. So. Now we are going to talk about some first aid skills, such as sprained ankles. So this is a, going back and forth, this is the picture of how to wrap an ankle. So you're going to go around the foot, wrap it around the ankle a few times, and then go up the leg. This picture shows a hand holding the gauze on but this gauze is kind of sticky so it will stick together so the steps to do follow when wrapping a sprained ankle is to wrap the gauze around the foot about two times go around the ankle and heel in a figure eight so that's what this picture is showing you going around in a figure eight. Then a few wraps around the lower leg. You want to make sure that it's tight enough to stay on and to help heal the ankle, but you don't want it to be too tight to restrict the blood flow. It can cause more damage than good if you have it too tight. So. We have our little stuff. And this is what we're going to show you, and we will practice this later. Get into groups when we are wrapping a sprained ankle. So you go around his foot, and you make a 
figure eight. A little too small. Okay. Then you want to go up his leg. Okay, so CPR, this is um, performed when someone is unconscious, not breathing. So you want to make sure to call 911 immediately. If you're alone, call 911, then you can start CPR. Make sure um, if there's someone else in the room, you can get them, like an adult, to call 911. Um, so CPR, um, the most important thing is chest compressions. Uh, you want to make sure that you're going in two inches deep, about a hundred compressions. Then we will do um, two breaths. If you're not comfortable with breaths, that's okay. You just make sure to do the chest compressions. Um, some tips, you want to avoid interruption. So when you start compressions, don't stop. Yeah, don't stop until someone else is there to take over until the person starts breathing. We'll make sure to keep that blood flow going. Um, don't lean into the person to do CPR, so to like, don't lean over them. You're not going to be at the correct angle to do the compressions correctly. You want to make sure that we have proper hand placement. So, proper hand placement is like right in the middle of the chest middle finger right there okay so we have CPR is easy as C A B compression so you want to push hard and fast on the center of the victim's chest um, then we have airway tilt the victim's head back and lift the chin open for the airway breathing give mouth and mouth rescue breaths. Um, we do have like little plastic things to go over the person's mouth. You might want to just wait and do compressions until you get like pr the plastic piece to protect you and them. Okay, so steps to perform CPR. Check the scene for safety. Then ask the person if they're okay and if they can hear you. So you want to get them like if they're unconscious and in puddle of water. You want to get them out of the water, um, roll them over, make sure they're not still swallowing the water. And you're like, hey, hey, are you okay? Um, call 911 as soon as you can. Then we are going to tilt the head and lift the chin to open the airway. You want it to check for breathing. So you want to like look down at their chest, see if their chest is like in and out. Um, now it's time to do the, the CPR. So you want to push through the compressions two inches deep, 100 to 120 compressions. Um, after that, you'll do two rescue breaths. When you do the rescue breath, tilt the head back and lift the chin. Um, continue until the AD comes, EMT comes, or they wake up. How to help a child choking. When, so like signs that they're choking is if they can't talk, they can't breathe, they're like <coughs> um, They're making squeaky noises and they're coughing. You want to give them five back blows and then like abdominal, abdominal thrust, which is also known as the how much maneuver. You want to alternate between the two until the food is dislodged. This would be most common and the lunchroom. So everyone that has lunchroom duty needs to be aware. The lunch lady staff can need to know this information. So steps on how to do the homework remover. Um, you want to stand behind the child and make a fist right above the child's belly button. And then when you have the fist, take your other hand and just 
press into this hand and press into the stomach. Um, you're going to do that six to ten times, abdominal thrust, and feel the food is out. So you'll do that a few times, and then you'll go back to the five back flows, back and forth until you have the food out. If you're having trouble, you want to make sure that um, the other side that's around you can call the EMTs to get, come. Okay, so steps to use an EpiPen. I have this one. Oh, I should have brought the practice one. But um, when I got this, they said the most important thing when using it is to hit it hard enough in the leg that the medication gets into your body. They said the most common mistake is not hitting hard enough and then the medicine won't come out. Uh, kind of hurts when you're hitting that hard into the leg. But you're giving them life-saving medication, so a little bruise is worth it when trying to save their life. So you want to take this cap off and then you're going to swing and push it into your outer thigh. Hear a click and when you hear the click, hold it for three seconds until um, all the medication, that gives time for all the medication to come out. Now after you use an EpiPen, it's still important that they go to an ER because they will need other medications. Most of the time, they will need other medications like steroids, so they'll need to go to the ER and call 911, notify parents. And when we're giving this, so the outer thigh, and the reason you have to like swing so hard, okay, it's the middle of winter, you have to go through your blue jeans. So think of how thick those clothes are that you're wanting to get that needle into their leg. Okay, so sting treatments with like bee stings, don't, do not squeeze the stinger out. You'll want to scrape, scrape it gently. Um, the website that I found says with the blade or a debit card, so most common you'll have like a debit card or something on you, like that. Then you want to wash the site and apply a cold compress on it. That helps with like relieving the inflammation. Um, you do want to have an EpiPen in case they are allergic to bees and do whatever was on the side for. So treat, how to treat a bleeding side. This might be um, a child is running with scissors and they get stabbed. So you want to cover the wound with a clean compress, press firmly. Now if the scissors are still in there, you don't want to remove the scissors. Um, you want to elevate injury above the heart if, if you think there's no broken bones, if the scissors are out. Apply a bandage, but make sure it's like tight, there's pressure there, um, and then seek medical help. You want pressure, pressure on the wound to make sure the bleeding will stop. Okay, so feigning, if a child faints, you want to lay them on the back and loosen their clothes, so unzip jackets. If a child vomits, vomits, tilt their head to the side. You don't want them to swallow the vomit because then you're going to have a worse problem. Uh, make sure to put a wet towel on their face. It helps wake them up. So symptoms of fainting, if someone has blurry vision, they're pale, they're sweating, and temporary unconsciousness. Okay, so a sunstroke, this might occur on a hot day, like field day. So you want to make sure that their head is raised, reduce their temperature. So some kids wear blue jeans to field day. If they have blue jeans on, make sure to roll their pants leg up to like their knees. Um, put cold uh, like ice on their shirt, like in their shirt, wrap, like get a cold napkin, put it on their forehead, the back of the neck. Don't give them any stimulants, medication. So remove extra clothing. Roll your pants up, take your jackets off, take their socks off, shoe socks. Okay, so burns. 
Um, this is what happened in arts and crafts class with a hot glue gun. So you want to put the hand or area in cold water, then pat it dry, cover it in a bandage. So we do have burn cream in this kit, but you only want to use it if it's a first degree burn. Second and third degree burns, you don't want to put medication on it. So they do need to seek medical help depending on how bad the burn is. And if it's blistered up, we don't want to pop it. Just let them go to the doctor. Okay, so now we're gonna get into groups and we are going to practice putting our gloves on and wrapping our little ankle. So the most common thing I think that happens at schools is children are running, they'll get a sprained ankle. So I think this is why it's very important to have this there. I've seen that a lot. It's like running the mile for their PE class. We'll quickly review it. Get this untangled. Okay. So, once again, wrap it around their foot. Make sure it's tight enough, but not too tight. Then you're going to go into a figure eight. So, right here, right there, got the eight going on, then you go up their leg, and you can pin it if you have like a metal pin, there's some safety pins in this first aid kit that came in there, all of this is, this frame is sticky so it'll stick together. So everyone take a turn and do that. Okay. Now we will practice taking off gloves. take off gloves you can do it like this or you can take this hand pinch it in pull it out and then you want to take your clean hand and slide underneath this glove you don't want to touch it and roll it like this and go wash your hands So a school safety plan, these are important to have for substitutes, these are also important for you and your prayer pro or you to have. Um, so it's an emergency outline of what to do, it's an outline of what to do during an emergency. It can be like a little folder, there's going to be a few different paperwork that you're going to have in there. There are information about fire drills, tornado drills, um, what to do for strangers on the property. We had that happen a few times when I was in school. Like there was just a couple arguing. Our school got put on lockdown and we had to lock all the doors, turn the lights off, stuff like that. So you wanna have a map of the school. You need, the map of the school will show where all the exits and entrances are. So if you're new to school, you just might not know where all of them are if you're not always on that certain hallway or um, substitutes. So it'll show you all the exit, exits in case there's a fire. Um, you need to have a list of the students' like name, their contact 
information so their parents name or whoever can pick them up and a phone number to call in case of an emergency so we need to make sure we have it printed out and can be able to take that with us if we have to leave if the building's on fire just carry it all with us you also need to have a school identification badge so if someone comes to you to pick their child up in case of an emergency you need to have your id badge on to show them that you are their teacher you work there um also it's important to have a flashlight on hand so, so now we're going to do emergency versus non-emergency so life-threatening situations where 911 would need to be called you need to get help from other staff in the area so it's important to pull other teachers um, our staff into the classroom during very important emergencies like if someone's having a seizure so one teacher can handle the rest of the class one teacher to handle the emergency and one teacher to notify parents call EMTs get walk the EMTs from the front of the building to your classroom this could also just be a principal assistant principal that's doing all that so a non-emergency is an injury that's non-life-threatening, nosebleeds. Um, sometimes it's important to follow up with the primary care doctor. And it's also, it's always important to tell the parents anything that happened and treat the injury and then call the parents. So we have a list of emergency and non-emergency examples. So an emergency is like extremely high fever large wounds that are continuously bleeding even if they come to school with that wound because they had a bicycle accident but if it's still bleeding or they hit their leg like hit the wound on the desk and it starts to bleed you need to call their parents so they can go to the doctor burns broken bones blue lips fingers or toes because um, they're not getting enough oxygen in if they're vomiting or coughing up blood, if they have suicidal thoughts, sudden whole body numbness, or difficult breathing or swallowing, that these are examples of emergencies. So non-emergencies are earaches, pink eye, sore throat. Now, pink eye, you don't want them to come to school, but it's still not life-threatening. Rashes, now rashes, it's um, important to distinguish between like just a regular rash versus like um, a rash related to allergies because some rashes that are related to allergies can be very serious and they would need to call so make sure you have like a up-to-date list on all the child's allergies and what their reaction to the allergy is um, cough and cold and seasonal allergies these are non-emergency Okay, so a special needs classroom, these children have um, conditions that they need help with. Some of them have seizures, and with that, we will need extra teachers in the room to help when there's an emergency. So when a child is having a seizure, we'll need to have a teacher there to help them and a teacher to handle the rest of the class. And it's just best to have two teachers in the room since you never know when an emergency like that is going to happen. Um, some of these students do have balance issues, so the classrooms need to have extra padding like on the floor instead of just hot, hard tile. We need to have all the corners on the table and desk covered. Um, we need to make sure that because they do need help walking, they might have like a walker or assisting device, that the classroom is big enough to have like big walkways and then last is to make sure all the outlet outlets are covered because some of these students might not understand the dangers of like outlets most students have learned by the time they start school don't stick your finger in the outlets but some of these students who have learning disabilities may not understand dangers so here's the outlet covers and they're like baby proofing here's some Walking assistance is handful. That's kind of like a big machine that you would need 
to have enough space into the classroom. Okay, so how to treat an electric shock injury. So the student that stuck their finger in an uncovered outlet. You need to call 911 and seek a medical help immediately. You need to remove the child from the outlet and break the electrical source. Um, if CPR, CPR is necessary if the child is unconscious. Make sure there's nothing like metal or wet on you or the child before you go and touch them to pull them away from it because then that's worse. So why is all this information important? It's important to have all this information to be prepared um, in case of an injury happens. You never know when an injury is going to happen. So we need to review all this information. Um, review topics that you may have forgotten and we will learn new information. So that's why all this stuff that we've gone over today is important. So we have a post quiz that we will take about five minutes on. Okay. Also, this first aid kit came with a pamphlet. It shows you how to do like CPR, Heimlich, and it has other things listed on here. Spanish, uh, like bleeding, burns, what some are the symptoms and what are the treatments. This is the brochure pamphlet that came in the first aid kit that I was talking about um, just a second ago. Okay, so we are going to take our post quiz. If you will just put your initials so I can compare your results to your first one so I can see hopefully we learned something today and thank you so much
So for our quiz, I'm going to review our quiz questions and answers. So first aid is, an answer is providing basic medical help. A first aid kit supplies would be all but aloe vera. So I know the aloe vera sometimes can be used for burns, but remember we said we don't need to put um, cream or ointment on the burns if it's second or third degree, so make sure the doctor has given you permission to point, put that cream on there. So three things in a school safety plan is a map, school ID badge, and student contact list. Number four, an emergency is life-threatening um, situation. You would need to call 911. True or false, special needs classroom needs extra teachers. So yes, because there could be an emergency. There could be two emergencies at one time. If a child is having a seizure and another child that has um, balance issues fall. Okay. So true or false, it's okay to pull the scissors out if a child falls with scissors in their hands and gets stabbed from, from the bleeding child is false. Do you squeeze a stinger out from a bee sting? Uh, no. When a child is choking, uh, what do you do? You give five back blows and then five, five stomach thrusts back and forth. So number nine, you would hold an EpiPen for how many seconds for the a medication to be injected? It's uh, three seconds. Ten, if a child gets burnt, you can put burn cream on the side. So no, only if it's first degree, which goes with most other questions we have. So our summary is first aid is providing basic medical help Few things that belong in a first aid kit are galls, band-aids, thermometers, antiseptic wipes. We have the whole list. Um, things in a school safety plan, name of students and parent information, maps, an emergency is when 911 is needed to be called. So now I'm going to hand you a brochure. It has my contact information on there in case you have any questions. And it just has a summary of what we've gone through today. And this is my brochure. I am going to go over it in the next video clip. So here is my brochure. So it's first aid in school. Here is my email. Um, so we have the definition of first aid. Can be used in major emergencies before EMT is arrived. We have examples. Here is the chart with the first aid kit and supplies list. We have band-aids, tweezers, ice packs, galls, gloves, a pen, inhaler, thermometer. Um, a school safety plan checklist, student contact information, map of the school, school ID badge, and it's an emergency, it's a list, an outline of what to do in case of an emergency. So we have non-emergency versus emergency, so emergencies, call 911, it's life threatening, get help from other staff and people around you. When there's large wounds that continue to bleed, burns, broken bones, coughing blood, difficult bleeding, non-emergencies, um, non-life-threatening conditions, just follow up with your primary care doctor. So earaches, pink eye, sore throat. So I have on my brochure that first aid in school is important to keep up to date for the safety of children but you can also use it if another staff member is having problems because 
me. CPR can be used if someone has a heart attack. Everything can be used on adults that have allergies. So special needs classrooms, they will need extra teachers or staff because they're dealing with complex medical issues. You want to make sure all the outlets are covered. Um, the extra teacher can be there for the seizure prone child. Some students have balance issues, so extra padding in case of falls. Make sure all corners are padded and wrapped. And they might need a bigger classroom space for walkers. And there is my references. Anyone have any questions? Okay. These are my references. And thank you so much for coming today.